Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for where we are in the church in Ghana, in the church all over Africa, and in the church everywhere in the world. Lord, we pray that your word, that on this rock, you build your church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail, will not prevail, must not prevail on the church of the living God. Lord, strengthen our leaders, our bishops, our pastors, and all the ministers and the professionals of this country. Lord, we pray that the church will come stronger. We pray that our professionals will become more resourceful in Jesus' name. Bless us here and use us to bless this country. And then all the leaders of the church and workers all over the world that are gathering together, connected with us, we pray that your goodness will overshadow everyone. We will go higher. We will do more. We will achieve more. Even in this our day, your power will be mighty in the whole church universal. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. You understand that we're talking about the grace of God and the power of God in this end time so that with that grace and power we can evangelize our world. My topic today is profitable pursuit and perseverance in the end time harvest pursuit and perseverance in the harvest in these end times profitable pursuit and perseverance in the end time harvest we're looking at Matthew chapter 24 and I read from verse 3 it says, and as I sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of, the, of thy coming and of the end of the world? Do you notice there are three things? When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming? And what shall be the sign of the end of the world? If the world will not end, Christ will have corrected them. They were disciples, they were learners, and they came to learn from their master and the teacher and the Messiah and the Savior that has come into the world. He would have said, now, disciple means learner. And since you came to learn and you said the world is going to come to an end, no, 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 it's not going to come to an end. He would have corrected them, but because he didn't correct them, that means the world will eventually come to an end. And if the world will come to an end, there is the end time. And then we come to verse 4. It says in verse, they said in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. It means that at the end of the time, there will be men and women, there will be ministers and preachers that will deceive us, that will try to deceive the disciples and the church. And so he said, Take heed that no man whatever his status, no man, whatever his authority, no man, whatever cloud he collects around himself, take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 5, in verse 5 it says, for many shall come 
in my name end time. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. In verse 6, it tells us, it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. It said, you don't even have to glue your ear to the radio, glue your sight to the television, the information, and the news will be everywhere. It says you will hear. And how many of us are not hearing, we're hearing. And then it says there'll be rumors of wars and wars as well. See that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That means when you hear of those wars and rumors of wars, you're not packing your ministerial bag, your professional bag, and saying uh, the end has come. It says, no, that end has not come. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, and for nation shall rise against nation. This country might rise against that country, and this nation against another nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, don't we see that? Pestilences, peculiar plagues and sicknesses and disease and earthquakes. Are we hearing about that today? In diverse different places. And then it says in verse 8, in verse 8, all these, the pestilences and the plagues and the diseases and the storms and the waves and the kingdoms of this world fighting against each other, it said all these are the beginning of sorrows. What does that mean? It says, this is even the beginning and the lowest ebb is going to escalate as the end draws near. All those confusions and rumors of wars, it said, it's going to increase and escalate because all that we hear now, all that we see now, they're just the beginning of of sorrows, verse 9, in verse 9 it says, Then shall they deliver you and to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It's saying there's going to be persecution, but the persecution will not destroy the church in the world, anywhere. All those things that are the beginning of sorrows on you as a person, on the church as a local church, on the church as the global church, the hotter the fire, the stronger the church will be. And the stronger you will be. The Lord is telling us when you hear everything happening and you see everything happening, don't drop your head and say, I am finished. No, you are not finished, but your problems are finished. At Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fire and the fire only burnt the rope of Nebuchadnezzar that tied them, but they stood up in the fire. And they walked in the fire. And the Son of God was with them in the fire. So shall it be for the church going through the fire of persecution. The local church, the national church, a national denomination. As we look unto Christ, the fourth person in the fire, in the furnace, it will be with you know your name, I know I know your name is Ghanaian name or maybe another nation's name, but today the Lord is giving you the name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, what do we do in the last time? That is, in the period of the end time, what are we going to do? Look at verse uh, 14. In verse 14, it now tells us, and this gospel 
of the kingdom. In the time in which we live, in the end time, when all those commotions are there and the wars and the rumors of wars, he said, even at that time, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, in all the world, nation against nation, rumors of wars and wars and all those things, even at such a time, it says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Not another gospel, <laughs> you see, sometimes when, uh, you know, a teacher sees that the students are not paying attention. And the students want something uh, that is watered down. And they say, sir, this subject you are teaching, uh, I had of, you know, simple equations before now. It's uh, another kind of uh, thing. I'm hearing some of equation, quadratic, whatever. Uh, this one is too tough. Lower it. If you lower it, your students will not pass the exam that they came to that school to prepare for to pass. The same thing with the preacher. The preacher, the, the, the pastor, and the teacher of the word coming from the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher. If we lower the standard, if we say things are tough now. People are poor now. People are confused now. People are dejected now. And then we come to, we turn to motivational speakers. And we're no more preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Our students, our members will fail the final exam. They will not get to heaven. Whatever the condition of the world and whatever the trauma and whatever the pressure and whatever the situation in this end time, this same gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come and we are the ministers and we are the people men and women and professionals that god has called at this time and we're going to have profitable pursuit and perseverance in the end time harvest we're looking at three subtitles number one describing the end time people to be harvested. We want to get into the harvest. We want to preach the gospel. We want to touch lives, turn lives around. We need to know the people we are harvesting. Number one is describing the end time people to be harvested. Number two, discovering the end time power, passion, for the harvest. We need to discover, we need to discern, we need to declare, we need to have, we need to possess the passion and time passion. If you, when you look at that passion, it means your excitement, your devotion, your concentration, the drive that you have within you. We cannot be sleeping on the pulpit. We cannot be tired on the pulpit. We cannot be weary on the pulpit. We cannot say, but this is a difficult congregation, and this is a difficult time, and the church is going through a lot now. We need to wipe their tears. We need to do this, and we need to, you know, be carers of the people, and no more preachers of the word. We must have age time passion for the harvest if the world is becoming more difficult we also become more tough at tough times in tough times only tough men and women only tough professionals, only tough people that know where they're coming from and where they are and what they have come here to do. You must be tough-minded when the times are tough. The ministers and the preachers and the professionals must be tougher than the tough time. And we need to have passion, discovering the end time passion for the harvest. Number three, declaring the end time possession 
declaring the end time possession of holistic healing. Holistic healing. Holistic means everything gathered together from the smallest to the greatest, the internal, the soul, the spirit, the mind, and you have healing holistically, completely, every which whole in your personality, in your behavior, and in your tribe, everything you have to know. There is no speck, there is no spot, there is no stain of weakness in your personality. That's where we are today. That's what you are going to get before you go. We're looking at number one. Number one is describing the end time people to be harvested. John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 34. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And to finish his work. Notice that. And then when he was at the cross, he said, It is finished. You must be measuring the level and the height and the progress of what you have in the work he has committed to you. He said, this is my meat and this is my joy and this is my passion and this is all I'm aiming at and going at that I will finish the work he has given me to do. And the testimony came it is Finish. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Do not say it's raining time, and we cannot evangelize or do the harvest now. Do not say this is a tough time, this is a difficult time. And it's not time yet. Maybe by four months, the time will come. He said, don't say that. I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the field. For they are white already to harvest. Verse 36, it says, and he that receiveth wages, he that reapeth receiveth wages. You will not lose your reward you will receive here on earth and then when you get to heaven i will not i don't know what i will recognize you because your glory will be so bright and shining you'll be rewarded in jesus name and then it says you gather fruit unto life eternal and both that both he that soweth and he that reapeth we rejoice together. Verse 37. In verse 37, and herein is the same true. One soweth and another reapeth. Verse 38, it says, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. All the men labored and ye are entered into their labors. What does that mean? I send you to labor. I send you to reap wherein ye bestowed no labor. All the men have labored. Think of the Bible we have in our hands. Other people have studied the original language, Hebrew and Greek and the ancient languages and are able to uh, translate from the original language to the Bible we have, either the Bible in English or the Bible in our national language or the Bible in other languages. They labored and the labor sleepless nights that they did to be able to give us the Bible. Look at the songs we sing. Other people have labored, Charles Wesley and many other people that they labored so much and they gave us the song deep with meaning and we come now to bless the people of God with those songs but you know the songs are already composed they were already there most of them those old old songs old old hymns 
full of meaning and full of the Bible better than all the, you know, new, new songs. The new songs, they have their place when you want to dance, you want to enjoy. They have their place, but when you want to have deep spiritual understanding. Other people labor that we come into their labor to do what they're doing. Look at this church building. Other people labored. They labored for years. They labored for months. And now they have given us a look at the microphone and everything. Other people labored. Other people have labored. Well, it's not just us now, but the Lord said, you compliment and you make use, you make profitable what other people have done. And now I send you and you enter into their labor so that the real final profit of the world you bring to the congregation and you bring to our world so that those of us who are now preaching and the people who have labored before us, us together, we will have our rewards in Jesus' name. You will not miss your reward. You will not stop until you finish and come to the end of your assignment in Jesus' name. Look at, look at three things here. Three things as we describe, as we discover, and time people to be harvested. Number one, the dreadful pursuits of the fatal end time period the period in which we live in which we're ministering what's the period like number two is the deadening peculiarities of end time people I want to minister to them. We're so eager. We want them to have salvation. We're so eager. We want them to get out of the broad way and come to the narrow way, the redemptive way that leads to heaven. What do they look like? How do they react? How do they respond? How do they take the message we have to them? We come with love. We come with passion. And we come with the Spirit of God. We want to preach to these people what are their peculiarities, deadening peculiarities. Look at number three there. Number three, deluding perception of faithless and time of pilgrims. Look at number one. Number one is the dreadful pursuits of fatal end time period. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Not even the angels of heaven. Did you hear the other day somebody rising up? It's joined his own observation, scientific observation, and it's joined that with his uh, prophetic prodigy. And now he says what Jesus said, only the Father knows, even the angels do not know, he has climbed up to the height of spirituality above the angels and they are now telling us this is the date he will come. This is the time he will come. Those are the liars, deceivers. Jesus said of that day and of that hour, no, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And then in verse 37, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Noah were, the days of Noah were the end of an era. The flood will come will sweep everybody away and anyone that is going to be saved from that situation will have to enter into the ark and Noah and a minority his family believed what others did not believe the people who are always for the majority they do not have any sense of their own 
any match of their own, any kind of examination, analysis of the times on their own in the majority. And you know, there are people that fear to be in the minority. And what other people shout, that's what they chorus, that's what they believe. But at the days of Noah, when only the minority believed a flood is coming, the end of this generation is coming. And only the people that believe that word and they enter into the ark, those who are the only people that will be preserved and secured. Where are you? today are you with the majority or the minority are you with bible believers or you are with ideologies and the scientists you know things are getting on and things are improving and this will never end where do you stand when you stand with god are you stand with the revelation of the word that only at the time when you act on what you know and believe, that the time you'll be saved, because it says, at the days of Noah, it says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, for at the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. That was their consequence concentration. I look at some churches today, you know, they say, come, I even hear of a particular uh, church, not in this country, of course, in another country, uh, that they will, they promise the young people, they give them wine, they, whatever they wanted, uh, to be able to spike, you know, their inner courage, whatever they give to them, eating and drinking. When we make the church, a church for socials, a church for dancing, a church for the young people to come and let go and release themselves, whatever they need, the music of the world, the attitude of the world, and the aspirations of the world, and the ambitions of the world, and the motivation of the world. Come, come, come. We have motivation here for you. Those motivational things don't get people thinking of themselves and thinking of their sin and thinking of salvation and the only way that leads to heaven. It says they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. If you look at our society today, the young people, they only think about marriage, marriage, marriage. And then, you know, some church preachers and leaders say, if you want to succeed in any profession, you must look at the demand and then the demand will determine the supply. What's the demand? They want to hear about marriage and they don't want to hear about fornication. Uh -uh. That one does not sell. They don't want to hear about Quit adultery and quit your smoking and quit your hard drugs and quit occultism. That one will not sell. And so, what will sell? Let go. Relax. Do whatever you want. Uh, some churches, they tell me there is no discipline in their church. There's no correction in their church. Whatever those young people do, that's what they enjoy. The demand determines the supply. That's economics, that's not Christianity. And then their daddies and their mommies, if you cannot correct the children, can you correct their daddies and their mommies and the financiers of those churches? No, they don't want that. That's the end time period. That's how people want. That's what they, that's what they live for. Then it said they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And then Jesus said in verse 39, it says, I knew not, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming 
of the Son of Man be. We're looking at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the deadening peculiarities of end time people. The attitude, the action, the lifestyle, and the response of end time people, they kill the spirit and they kill the soul. The peculiarities of end time people were harvesting and were preaching the gospel to the dead in even your zeal, the deadening peculiarities of end time people look at uh, first Timothy chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 1 it says now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times Paul believed there will be latter times and the preachers the apostles of the New Testament they believed and they declared there will be latter times and the spirit now speaks expressly without covering the mouth in speaking and without using human wisdom and time wisdom to say the truth in a way the people will not even be able to interpret that's what he means that's what the preacher means and the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times it says some shall depart from the faith I'll not be among them. You know, to depart from the faith does not happen in a single jump. Little by little, you preach of salvation, repentance, and faith in Christ. And the people look at you as if, what's he talking about? Repentance in this modern time? Coming away from evil in this modern time and having faith in the only one, only one. How about the heroes? We don't have faith in them. How about the philosophers? How about the authors? How about the writers? How about the people that move and shake the world? We don't have faith in them. What's this? Where is this man coming from? That is talking of faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Because there is no other person under the sun anywhere that can bring salvation to us except the name of jesus you know the people of these last days when you say this is the only way <laughs> they say this man is still primitive and he doesn't know that many roads lead to rome we're not going to rome we're going to heaven and only one way, only one way leads there. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that some, that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed, giving attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, speaking lies in hypocrisy there are people who have gone to the school of communication and they know how to communicate they know the body language they know the vocabulary and they know the minds of the people they know how to turn them on if they want them to weep they can you know raise the emotion and they weep and the very next minute they want the preachers the speakers the motivators they want them to laugh and to laugh their heads off they know how to do that they've gone to do the communication and you know education so that they can speak their lies in hypocrisy and some people you're sucked in you're taken in because of the communication not because of the content of what he's saying, but because of the communication that come to deceive, you will not be deceived. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, when I became a believer, born again believer, I've always been religious all my life. My daddy was so religious. And mommy is so religious. And they brought us children to be religious. But religion, 
is different from righteousness, the righteousness of God. I didn't have the righteousness that came with redemption through Christ, but only religious. When I became born again then, the Lord, when you will say born again, it's not just word of mouth. The Lord came into my heart. The Lord touched my conscience. And if I said anything mistakenly, even to a neighbor, even to a friend, even to a schoolmate, if I said anything that had some coloring, unfortunately, I'll go back there because my conscience will not leave me alone. I will go and talk to them and say, you know what? <laughs> the other thing, what I told you, was it yesterday I told you that? It wasn't the full truth. Let me tell you now. Because I had a conscience that is sensitive, responding to the truth. But you know people today, telling a lie, being hypocritical, denying the truth, painting up their lives as if they were angels. When they're like demons, they're like devils. Their conscience is so seared with a hot iron. And those are the kinds of people we're talking to today. And you preach the word, they shake that off. It touches their conscience. Say, thou art the man. Madam, thou art the woman. And they have so trained their conscience, they just shrug it off. It means nothing. Those are the people we're ministering to today and we're trying to harvest. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also. In 1 Timothy, he had told them what will be happening in the last days, end time period. Then he comes to 2 Timothy and he said, Timothy, hey, don't close your book, don't close your mind. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. In the last days, in the days in which we are living, and what the people were preaching the word to, it says, perilous time shall come. Then it says in verse 2, in verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. That means all they consider, like Achan, in going to war, all they consider is not to win the war for Israel, for the nation. It's to have some wedge of gold and Babylonish garment and all those things that attract the human unconverted eye. And then that's what they are pursuing. They'll be lovers of themselves. In the last days, they'll be lovers of themselves and there will be Absalom will not be looking for the joy of David. <laughs> What's that to me? I want to be happy. They'll not be, they'll not be living for the establishment of the throne of David. What's that for me? Although God said that and God put him there, I want to be there. They'll be lovers of their own selves. My wife is not pretty enough and is not considering what how sorrowful the wife will be. If he takes any step that will kind of uh, make the woman sorrowful, she's not pretty enough. And then they have the uh, people in their congregation. That one is uh, more beautiful than my wife. That one is more pretty than my wife. They're only thinking of themselves, what they will have, not what the other person will suffer in the last days will have people that are selfish self-centered and egotistic only what they want they want uh, you know the beauty of that woman they want the beauty of that flower and it can pluck the, uh, the flower from it from her root so that it will minister to what they want and it says men shall be lovers of their own selves 
covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. But three tells us, it says, without natural affection. Even the affection that, uh, you know, natural people who are not born again uh, ought to have, uh, the affection that a, a, a mother ought to have for the child, the affection a father ought to have for the boys and for all the children, natural affection, that is gone. It's the last days. And when you look at people that were ministering to the people, were preaching to the people, were bringing out of the darkness of the world and were bringing them to the light of the gospel, this is how they are. And as you're preaching to honor Christ, to exalt Christ, and to look at the suffering of Christ, they're not looking at the suffering of Christ, they're looking at the suffering they have themselves. And it says, incontinent accusers false accusers and then it says the truth breakers and their fears you know gone over the days when a young man could approach um, you know a man and say sir I'm looking for this particular street can you show me and a boy the girl looks up the fierceness that people carry out in their lives, it's like, stay where you are. I'm staying where I am. Their faces and their fierceness will drive you up. They say, you are coming. Uh -huh. Teacher is coming. It's going to correct me. It's going to point out this and this and that. And we people of any time period, we don't want any policeman of a preacher coming to talk to us and as it's coming we already have the fierceness on our faces and the fellow will get the message that's the world in which we're living those are the people we're trying to minister to and they're despisers of those that are good Nobody is good except themselves. In verse 4, in verse 4, it tells us traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Preacher, do you want the, your church, your ministry to grow, to start with? Not your ministry, not my ministry is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Do I want you to grow for Christ, not for me? For Christ, not because of the finance I will get. For Christ, not because I want a big number. Who am I? I am not the owner of the kingdom. But you want your church, your ministry to grow. Yes, I do. Well, you know, you're too old-fashioned, and you, you're too Bible-based. You read everything with the dot of the I, with the cross of the T. Your church will not grow that way. If your church is going to grow, you must mellow it down, doctor it, and tailor it. Now, please pardon my illustration. I came to Ghana the first time, 1977-78. And then we had a moderate crusade in Kumasi, Ghana. And then I waited behind so that I could do some follow-up a discipleship and a few people who were here at that time when I came more than 40 years ago as I came and stayed back for the um, follow-up discipleship the ministers not here there called me I was in their midst like Jonah in the midst of the whale and I, I wasn't, I didn't have all the knowledge I have now. And he said, we appreciate you, you come to our country. 
and you're preaching the word of God. Only one thing, only one thing. You've uh, done it in Nigeria and you appeared successful moderately. Now they said, this is not Nigeria. They told me point blank, this is Ghana. And if you preach the word you're preaching in Nigeria, you bring it here, we love you. We don't want to, you to waste your time. It will not work. I said, but it's the Bible. They say, we're helping you. We're trying to tell you that preaching everything from beginning to the end and not quoting it and not modifying it and not changing a little bit, it will not work here. And then I stood up, I said, I believe the word of God will work anywhere, everywhere. So they told me, okay, we'll try to help you, but you are not receiving help. They say, bye-bye. And I didn't understand what will happen. I came the following weekend because I was still lecturing at the University of Lagos and I only could come on weekends to continue the follow-up. We were about 750 the previous time. When I came the following time, the number reduced to about 30 people. 10, 10, 10, 30 people. I used to see the hall filled up. And now I came to the 30 people to prove what they were telling me, that this will not work over here. But I picked up my Bible and the same word, my words cannot save anyone. It says words from on high that will save. And then we began afresh from 30 to 50 to 100 to uh, 1,000 and to thousands and thousands. And I want to announce to you the membership of the church deeper life now. I, I took a chill from you to allow me to be personal a little bit, then I'll come back to you. Is that all right? Amen. The church now in Ghana Deeper Life is next to the membership of Nigeria. And because we stayed on the world, our leadership here, our, you know, organization here, and even this crusade we're having, I've gone to many parts of Nigeria. I've gone outside Nigeria. This one is number one. I'm saying that whatever may be the action or reaction of the people we're ministering to, stay with the word. Stay with the word. The Lord will raise you up. The, the Lord will build you up. We don't swerve to error and swerve to false doctrine and swerve to moderating, doctoring, changing, modifying the word. Stay with the word. Even in these last days, the work of God will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. We're looking at verse 7. Verse 7 tells us the people we're ministering to in this end time period. It says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But all the same, we're going to keep on ministering the word and the word will bear fruit everywhere you go in Jesus' name. Number three, number three now is the uh, delusion. 
deluding perception of faithless and time pilgrims. We're looking at Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. Luke chapter 18, we're looking at verse 8. I tell you that, uh, that he will avenge speedily. That is when we pray at this end time. And we have faith in God. The Lord will answer. The Lord will respond. And the Lord will avenge speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth as the Lord is about to come? In this end time a period, he's looking for faith. Why? It is through faith we we'll get saved. It is through faith he purifies our hearts and he sanctifies us. It is through faith we have the blessing of Abraham. It is through faith we have the miracles and the wonders and the signs that he promised the church. It is through faith we have everything we need. Any other thing, whatever it is, any other thing cannot give you what faith can give you. And Jesus said when he comes, He'll be looking for saved people, but that will only happen by faith. When it comes, he'll be looking for people that follow peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And that can only happen by faith. When he comes, he'll be looking for the people that have received the fullness of the provision of the first coming so that they can have the privilege of the second coming. And that can only happen by faith. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The end time people will be faithless people. And many things make them to be faithless. They now have the, you know, the, the machinery and the, the social media and everything. And they think whatever they want to get, they can get all that through the men and the machinery. So do they need any miracle? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I pray he'll find faith in our hearts. In your heart, in my heart, and find faith in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at discovering the end time passion for the harvest. If anything you want to do, if you don't have passion, if you don't have drive, you'll be looking at, am I not tired now? Am I not weak and weary now? Do I think I have the energy I used to have when I was 25, 35? Let the young people continue to do it. And I want to relax a little bit. You understand? When you have passion, you have drive within you. And you have the very mind of Christ. And you have the purpose of Christ. And the drive that Christ had. That when, you know, he started his ministry. Working miracles, working miracles. Healing the sick. And eventually, one of those people, Judas Iscariot, betrayed him. Now they caught him. They arrested him. And they were now going to crucify him. And Peter, by his side, said that will not happen here. He threw out his, he drew out his sword and he slashed off the ear of the uh, servant of uh, Marcos or whoever and the passion, the passion to heal the sick, the passion to restore everything that is cut off from us at such a time, with such a challenge, with such difficulty, what would you have 
done and a helper, a supporter. You didn't have any sword. You don't want to fight and you cannot fight. Okay, we'll fight for you. And he drew the sword and cut off the ear. You will not have passion to heal the fellow. That fellow is an enemy and that fellow was among the people that came to arrest me. The passion of Christ is stooped down. And he took the cut off air and stick it back there again, still performing miracles at the time. He should have been totally weary and worn and tired. And now he's on the cross hanging there. And there were two thieves that were, that were crucified alongside. And they were talking and talking. And then one man that was going to spend his last day day on earth in the pain and he says if I'm having such pain here on earth on the cross when I get to the other side and I meet the judge of all people where how can I bear the pain and so right on the cross there hanging he looked the direction of Christ and said Lord he called him Lord there I didn't have the opportunity to call you Lord while I was still here before I came to the cross but now here on the cross as a sinner condemned sinner on earth Lord remember me when you come to your kingdom you have to have passion before you can reply that man at the last hour at the greatest time of suffering in your life you have to have passion you have to have love you have to have desire for the goodness of others before you can reply today thou shalt be with me in paradise that God will give us passion that God will give us the drive from within. The love for souls that will, will reach out to them whatever is happening to us. And as God uses you to solve other people's problems, your own problems too will be solved in Jesus' name. It will solve your problem. It will carry your load. It will bear your body, but never decrease your passion and your love for souls. Discovering the end time passion for the harvest. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Actually, Paul at this time was before these kings, Agrippa and the other fellow Felix, that the fellow said, they accused this man, is worthy of death. And I cannot send him to Caesar without writing something. So they said, okay, come and talk for yourself. And instead of talking and about himself, he said, I'm talking about Jesus. I had passion. And I still have that passion. And he says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And I'm not about to yield. I'm not about to be crushed. I'm not about to give up my passion. As the fire grew hotter, the passion of the apostle, the passion of the man also went up. Your passion will not diminish. End time passion. End time fervor. End time drive that the Lord gives us so that we can win the lost and bring the lost to the Lord. Three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at endowed prophets for allied and time harvest. Two together, three together. If those three that are joining together for end time harvest, A has passion. B is tagging on and wondering when are we going to stop this? 
when are we going to end this? And the third one is saying, maybe I should tell Abe that I'm fagged out. I'm weary. I'm worn. I cannot do anything anymore. And so A, instead of concentrating on the harvest, is concentrating on helping B and helping C. No, but when the three of us, we have the passion, we have the drive, we are go-getters for the kingdom and for the Lord. And we're not trying to, you know, wipe the tears of somebody and care for the wounds of another one. We're all for the harvest before us. We endowed prophets, proclaimers, preachers, pastors, evangelists, allied for end time harvest. Number two is the endued preachers for already in damaged harvest. And then number three is enduring. Enduring power for all endorsed harvesters. Look at number one. Number one, endowed prophets for allied end time harvest. In James chapter 5, reading from verse 16, James 5 verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Uh, when we read that, we normally, when I say we, I mean many ministers, we interpret that as confess your sins one to another. That's all right. That's appropriate if that's what you need to confess. But, you know, laziness is a fault. You know, always looking back instead of looking forward, that's a fault. Always standing and watching like a spectator. When you ought to be running as a participant, that's a fault procrastination that's a fault that i do it tomorrow i'll do it next week this is rainy season you can't evangelize now there's no money in the church now you cannot evangelize now what many people have in problems in the church and we need to settle all that before we can evangelize. Look at our Jerusalem. We still have many people in Jerusalem that are not converted. How can we go to Samaria? How can we go to Antioch? How can we go to Judea? That's a fault. And whatever you have been considering uh, that is stopping you from obeying the great commission. As a minister, you come before the Lord and you come before your fellow ministers Actually, I know I've been lazy. Actually, privately inside, I've been fearful. I've heard of those people I'm, I'm going to. I've heard that they're difficult and tough people. I am fearful. That's a fault. It's a terrible fault that will not make us to passionately go and do what the Lord has called us to do. Confess those faults one to another. And when you confess that, mop up the floor. What do I mean by that? The tap is running and then you suddenly come home and you see that the floor is flooded, flooded and it's going to spoil many things and then you start mopping the floor, mopping the floor but the tap keeps on running, keeps on running. You'll never stop mopping the floor because the tap is still running there. What do you do? Leave the floor on the ground and close the tap. The things that run in the church that makes the floor to be flooded, that gives us scandals in the church, that gives us the judgment of the world. And it's a hard church. They come to preach. They are not looking at the flood of iniquity and the flood of uh, evil and the flood of, uh, you know, 
antagonism within the church, and they're not looking at the flood of hatred. Look, the man touched that man's wife, and the man defiled that man's daughter, and did this and that all the flood is there, and we're mopping the floor, close the tab. Why is that coming? Where is that coming from? Rebuke the people that need rebuke. Correct the people that need correction. And let those faults that we are confessing, let them be wiped out from the very source. But when we're all laughing and smiling, we're not even confessing the faults one to another, that man, minister, bishop, apostle, whatever, is going to do that. And we're whispering in our corner, in our houses, this is bad. <laughs> come out. If you say it is bad, in your house, come to the church and declare, this is bad. And the person will, be, it will know that I will not allow this tap of filthy water feel the behavior to keep on running but if you keep that tap running the evil is there the backsliding is there the adultery is there the fornication is there and you also you mean you know all about it and then you bring the man and then it's all smiling and the church is clapping that's not the word. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Your prayer will work. My prayer will work. If we don't close our eyes to that tap running. If we don't close our eyes to the flooded ground and to the church that the public does not respect, the world they know, outsiders they know, all the people we're going to preach, they know that our tap is breaking out dirty water, is flooding our church, and we need to clean up. And when the world knows that we clean up and then we mop the floor and everyone now can come and we can pray for them and our prayers will be answered for them. The church of the living God in our nation, in every other nation, that church will grow in Jesus' name. I'm looking at verse 17. It says in verse 17, Elijah, Elias, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And then in verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. From today, we're not coming to the era, to the period when our ministries will bear much fruit. But you know, you know how Elijah did it is in First Kings chapter 18. In First Kings chapter 18, reading from verse 21. In verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people. Uh, you know, Elijah, everybody had been talking about him. Look at this man who was suffering. He loved heaven. Put the key in his pocket and he went where we cannot find him. I hate that man. He has said, I hate that man. He has said, have you found me, oh my enemy? He said, yes, I found you. He didn't chicken out. He wasn't afraid. A minister must hate sin, must hate bear worship, 
must hate evil. And if the people count you as their enemy, not because you are fighting on mundane things, but because you want to bring their heart back to the Lord. And, he, and Elijah came unto the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And then he gave the litmus test and said, let's make the altar. And let us put the sacrifice. And I will do that also. And whatever God, whichever God brings fire from heaven, that the God was out. He said, yes, that is it. And then all those 450 uh, prophets of Baal, they search the altar. And our man was looking at them. And then he put the sacrifice, was looking at, watching them, that they will not surreptitiously, secretly bring fire there. And they cried, and they prayed, and they shouted, no fire. Well, he did that for a long time. Elijah said, come aside. And now, let me have my own chance. You will have your own chance. I said, you will have your own chance. And what those 450 prophets of Baal were not able to do when your chance comes very soon. When your chance comes very soon you will do what all those hundreds and thousands of false prophets were not able to do. You know the story? He repaired the altar. Brothers and sisters, fellow ministers, colleagues, we cannot do anything new if we don't repair the altar. If we use the same altar as the false prophets built, the same methods, the same music, the same kind of secret power, the same deception, the same ideology. If we build the altar, we'll say, this one is there already. And the false prophets are using it. We can use it too. And then you pray like you pray, you hollow like you hollow, and you shout like you shout. You cut yourself like that they cut themselves. You roll on the ground like they roll on the ground. Nothing else will happen. If when they did it, with their method, with their magic, with their sorcery, with their occultism, with add drugs, if when they did, it did not work, if you do the same thing, if you walk on the same road, if you approach God, the same way they approach their bail, it will not work. He repaired the altar. He set everything in order. And he said, pour water there, four, four, four. That means there are 12 barrels poured there. Like the 12 tribes of Israel, at, at the time of the evening sacrifice, he stepped aside, then he looked up to heaven. And he said, God, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel, let the people know that I have done all these things according to thy word. That's what will work. That's what will work. When you do it according to his word, not according to your mind, according to your ideas, according to your suggestion, according to your opinion, according to his word. And then he had not prayed longer and the fire came. The fire will come. Leaked up all the water and burnt even the stones because he did it at his word. And when you think about Moses, he did everything according to 
his word. And when you look at John the Baptist, he did everything according to his word. Build that sanctuary and build that tabernacle according to the pattern which was showed thee on the mount. When you are so meticulous and you keep to the word of God and you repent from the old prophets or from the bells, prophets, idea and message, the fire of revival will come. Your personal life, the fire will come. In your ministry, the fire will come. And you will have the same results as those passionate, zealous, peculiar servants of God in the old times. We're coming to number two there. Number two is the endued preachers. For already in damaged harvest, endued preachers. We need something from on high. Power from on high. Energy from on high. Ability from on high. The work is so great that we cannot depend only on our own strength, our own power, our own past experience. We need to be endued or power from on high because the harvest we are getting into, that harvest is already endangered and damaged. Many people have gone before us and they have said things about harvesting, about salvation, about being born again that is not real, that is not right. And we come now, and we're go if we're going to reverse anything, if we're going to make anything, uh, everything come anew and come afresh, we must have the endowment of power from on high. In Luke chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And did you listen to how Christ said that? He said, I know the Father. And whatever my Father, a Father in heaven, whatever my Father has promised to do to one person, to one family, to one nation, or to the world, or to the church, to the believers. I know my father enough that whatever is the promise of my father, nothing will change it. And the promise of the father to you today, nothing will change it in Jesus' name. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Have you noticed that it's a new thing for the apostles? Because whenever Jesus went to the mountain to, to pray, they were in a valley. He went alone. And every morning, he will go there to the mountain and pray unto the Father. He knew how to tarry before the Father. Have you noticed? Any time a miracle was being performed, it was only Jesus and the other. They were onlookers or watching him. They had not been tarrying. Even when he wanted to choose them, he went apart and he prayed. It was the one tarrying. And the one time he called three of them, he said, I'm sorrowful and I'm sorrowful unto death and I need to pray. Come along with me. And he tarried and prayed. They were sleeping. You see, the church is used to that. Let the bishop 
come and pray for us. Let the prophet come and pray for us. Let the minister come and pray for us. The church is not used to tarrying and praying. Yet, if we must be endued with power from on high, the tarrying must not be with Jesus alone, must not be with the apostle alone, must not be with the great minister alone. It says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. For how long? Three days? Seven days? Ten days? No. Not the days, not the hours, not the minutes, until, until, until ye be endued with power from on high. When we tarry before the Lord, we know what we're looking for. We're looking for the promise of the Father. We're looking for the power of the Holy Ghost. We're looking for the power that will shake everything shakeable here in our world. We're looking for the power that will possess and penetrate the hearts of men and bring them out of the hands of the devil and bring them to the bosom of the Lord. Endued with power from on high. I pray it will happen. Praying for two minutes may not make it happen. Praying for five minutes may not make it happen. But trusting the Lord that whatever he had said will be fulfilled. Tarry in the presence of the Lord for the purpose of having the endowment of power from on high until until, until it happens, you'll become a firebrand in Jesus' name. Number three now. Number three is the enduring power. Enduring power for all endorsed harvesters. The Lord sends us out as an harvester of souls. And we want to keep that on enduring. Now, look at the preachers, the prophets, the ministers, the people of God that went before us. They went on and on in enduring power. Moses, enduring power till the end. Joshua, enduring power till the end. Elijah, enduring power till the end. Elisha, Elisha had even died now, and then they had buried him, but the grave, the sepulchre, was not totally closed up yet, and some banks were bringing, it, uh, some people were bringing a dead man, and they spotted the banks that were running after them. And because of that, they were at that time at the grave of Elisha. And when they spotted and sighted the bands running after them, they dropped that dead man so they can run away. And even though Elisha appeared to have come to the end of his ministry, when they dropped that man, dead man, on a dead body, and both of Elisha, that, that dead man rose up. Amen. That tells me that the power can reside inside you until the very end of your life. Even look at Peter. When, when he prayed, God answered. When he touched people, God answered. When he lifted up the man in Acts chapter 3, the bone receives strength. But now, Peter, you're just walking now, and a shadow of Peter fell on the sick. He had not lost his voice, but even when you lose your voice, 
He had not lost his physical energy. But even when you lose your physical energy, and what you have remaining is your shadow, your shadow will heal the sick. Your voice will heal the sick. Your energy, you're able to stand, you're able to point, and you're able to declare, get up on your feet. It will happen. How will it happen? Because you believe, because you accept, and because you know when I go out and do it, it will happen. But if you don't do, the power will be inside there, but you don't carry it anywhere. You don't touch anyone. Your shadow does not fall on anyone. You don't speak to any challenge in any life. Come out. If you don't speak, if you're not available, although the power is there, nothing will happen. But from today, you will go forth in the power, in the strength of the Lord. And when you speak, something miraculous will happen. Another amen for yourself. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me on earth and in heaven. Look at verse 19. 19, go ye therefore. Hold on. All power is given unto Christ. The power to heal. But nobody will be healed now in Nazareth, Capernaum. Jerusalem, except the people that Jesus told go until they receive the power and now they go. That's when uh, miracles will happen. Did you notice all those 10 days after Jesus rose from the dead and those disciples, apostles, they stayed indoors no miracle happened. They were indoors, but then when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was a mighty wind from heaven and clothing tongues as a fire and it sat on each of them. Still outside, no miracle happened. And then they spoke in other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. Yet, outside that place where they were, no miracle happened. They got the power, dynamite. They got the power, healing power, restorative, restoration power. But no miracle happened. And then uh, the people all around, they came. They said, what is this? And then Peter stood up. Uh -huh. Miracles are going to begin to happen now. Christ has all the power. He's not going to use it directly here on earth. He has all the power on earth until the people receive the power and they stand up. And then Peter opened his mouth. And when he spoke, not something long, very brief, the people said, what shall we do? And he told them, repent, until he did something. Until he said something, until he invited them into repentance, nothing happened. And then 3,000 people came to know the Lord as their personal Savior because all power in Christ had been transferred to them. And they rose up and they spoke. And many signs and wonders were done by the apostles, not by Christ directly anymore. All the power that Jesus possessed was for their sake, for our sake. And when we rise up and and we go forth, all power in Christ will be manifested through you. 
and the power of the Holy Ghost that the Lord has given will be manifested in Jesus' name. And then it says in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. How often? I am with you. How often? Even, even, even unto the end of the world. You see with us now? I said, you see with us now? Just looking at us and appreciating us? No. To work is with us with all power. It's with you with all power. But you won't do anything. It'll just be there. All the power you need, it'll be, you know, pumping it into you. You are the one to manifest. He will be there to make sure all power is given unto you. And this morning, can I assure you, Christ of all power is there with you. But if you didn't go out, and to, you're not testing the power, you're affirming the power, and you're telling that person, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. If you don't say that, the power is there, but the power can only be activated through your voice. It will happen. What you, don't you then look at that and all the you know people that you meet you have they have any challenge you ask them what challenge do you have and you say this and this and uh, you know you say that's all right and then you pray when you pray power will manifest one of our dear sisters saw me yesterday and said that I came to our country here, Ghana, many years ago. The husband and herself have been having miscarriage, miscarriage, miscarriage five, six times. And then I came and they had opportunity to see me. And um, so the sister started her story. I said, that's enough, that's all right. And she wanted to explain everything so that I will know how serious the problem is. I said, that's enough, that's enough. And uh, so I said, in the name of Jesus, if I didn't open my mouth and uh, it's kind of uh, pour out the power, nothing would have happened. I would say, Jesus, would you know? Jesus is there with you with all power. I said, in the name of Jesus, Barrenness go. Living children come. And I said, That's all. She looked at me and said, I said, I had five, six miscarriages. I said, You are going to pray. I said, It is done. Somebody help me shout, It is done. And she saw me yesterday and she said the first child that came after that short prayer is now at the at finishing university now and the second child came is doing this and the third child came and is doing this the same power resides in you yeah. at Kumasi some years ago we had one of our dedicated workers and he was uh, nailing something and he fell to the ground. Instantaneously became paralyzed. He could have flown her to a, him to a crack here, but uh, no plane could take him because all the sides were having wounds. And it was like, it was a terrible situation. And then I went for to uh, Kumasi for, you know, a gathering of uh, the believers just to, to share the word of God together. And then uh, well, he, had, he had been in that condition for four years. And they couldn't pick him. They couldn't. It was excruciating pain. And then we mentioned the name of you. You can do that too. It's just that I make myself available. And as you make yourself available, wonderful things will happen through you in Jesus' name. 
And then I mentioned the name of Jesus. I was still praying. We had not come to the final amen. And then I had shout, shout, shout. And as we concluded the prayer, our brother who had been bedridden with all the sores in the body and with no energy and with no strength to stand up, all those sores in the body instantaneously, they were healed. The joints receive strength, and he was walking. I think, you know, if I remember, you know, walking more uh, faster than I could walk. Miracle. In your mouth. Miracle. Coming through your ministry. We have the power, and we have uh, the originator of the power standing there and sitting down there with us, and when you open your mouth, power will work. And all the other powers that have tied people down, all that, everything will be taken out of their lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. In point number three, we're declaring the end time possession of holistic healing. Holistic healing. Healing for you, the minister. Amen. Healing for you, the professional. And then you come out and you're still happy in your profession and your ministry. And the power is with you every time. You say, Pastor, I don't feel the power. Do you feel your intestine as we're sitting down there? Do you feel the inside of your ear as we're sitting down there? Do you feel your retina at the back of your eyeballs as you are there? No. The things we don't feel were possess. The things we don't feel were possess. You're standing. And you have to stand on your bones. Do you feel the bones? No. But the things you don't feel, you possess. Watch. I don't feel I possess. I thought you were going to say that for yourself. My brain, I don't feel age, but I possess age. And the power, the energy, the resources, the possession, and the know how, what you are going to do, how you are going to do it, you possess it already. It is when you open your mouth, if you activate what you have, that you will know it is there. I said, it is there. You know, I make use of my example so you will know how easy it is that what has happened to me will happen to you. At Magala Lagos in our church, we're having Sunday morning worship. And the people, as they were praying the prayer session, were supposed to stand up and be praying. And so, since it was another minister praying, I went down to the congregation, just walking around, just walking around. And his sister was, you know, bent her head on the bench in front of her. That morning, I didn't know. That morning, she was so sick. And she told the husband, I don't think I'll go to church today. I'm so sick. I don't think I can take any step. The husband said, I'll support you. I don't want to leave you at home sick like this. You alone. And with nobody to take care of you. And so she managed to come. I didn't know that. But I saw other people standing. And, um, you know, she wasn't standing. And she just leaned her head upon the bench.
preaching in front of her. And I felt, I wanted to, you know, as a good pastor, tell her to stand up. Other people are standing up. Why don't you stand up as we're praying? And so I gently laid my hands on her. And then she looked up and saw me. And I did this, get up. Immediately I tapped her so that she could get up. All the sicknesses disappeared. The power will move in your life. I let the power will be activated in your life. But if you don't move around, if you don't go around, if you don't lay that gentle hand on them, if you don't speak that word of power, how will the miracle happen? Your miracle carriers from today in Jesus' name. Declaring the end time possession of holistic healing. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the perception of household healing by gospel believers. Number two, the proclamation of holistic healing for global believers. Number three is the personalization of Hezekiah's healing by godly believers. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the perception of household healing by gospel believers. We're looking at Genesis chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 7. Genesis 20, verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die thou and all that are thine. Prophet Abraham. Generally, the Israelites don't call um, Abraham prophet. And the king of Gera, Abimelech, didn't call Abraham prophet. And all the sons of uh, Abraham, they don't usually call him prophet for God called him prophet. It's not the title they gave you. It's the title God himself gives you. And then in verse 14, verse 14 says, And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. What if Abimelech said, I don't believe in that. They call it restitution. I don't accept that. Any woman that comes into my house, and I've added that woman to the many wives I have, nobody can take that woman away anymore. He would have died. All in his house would have died. And God would have still brought Sarah out of that house. But this man, Abimelech, accepted the word of God. That's another woman's, another man's wife. That woman belongs to Abraham, not to me. And I'm taking that, and God says, restore that man's wife, otherwise you will die. And the man didn't want to die at this time. You will not die at this time. But do you know what the Lord had said? That daughter, restore her. You stole her away. That woman, restore him. You must not continue messing up with another man's wife. Restore her. And if you're a woman, restore him. You're not going to keep on messing up 
with another woman's husband. And when she di he did that, look at this in verse 17 now. In verse 17, so Abraham preached unto God, and God healed Abimelech. Amen. Amen. Healed his wife. Amen. Amen. Healed his maid servant. Amen. Amen. And they bear children. This day, as you obey the Lord, you are not obeying me. I'm not the originator of the word. God is the originator of the word. As you obey God this morning, infirmity is taken away from your household. Sickness is taken away from your family. And even though, even though, even though Abimelech called all his servants to tell them what God had told him, he was not seeking permission from all those people. God said, I shall restore this new woman that came to our family. What do you say? What? No, not seeking man's opinion. God has spoken. And what God has said that we will do. A great amen. amen. And so the Lord healed the household. He will heal your household in Jesus' name. Amen. Number two, number two is the proclamation of holistic healing for global believers. Holistic healing. That is every part of your life Every part of your profession, every part of your ministry, every part of the work of your hand, the healing of the Lord will touch everything, everyone around you, concerning you, in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 7, verse 23. John 27, verse 23. In the latter part, because I have made a man every which whole. I've made the man every which whole. That means every part, the brain, the blood, the body, the bones, the sinews, the nerves. Every which whole. And you can be perfectly whole today. You can be perfectly whole today. That's nothing no part of your body will have any sickness any disease in jesus name every witch hole holistic healing point number three here number three is the personalization of ezekiah's healing by godly believers. Ezekiah's healing. What kind of healing is that? We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 20. In 2 Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. Terminal sickness. End of life sickness, incurable disease. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Search thine house in order for thou shalt die and not live you see the double emphasis there thou shalt die Isaiah I understand that's enough and then Isaiah said and not lay sure definite final and now Ezekiah's healing I have Ezekiah's healing. I have Ezekiah's healing. Sometimes prophecies make us afraid. Prophets make us afraid. And they say, 
this will happen. And we look at their eyes, so firm and fiery. It's coming from the presence of the Lord. And he has said, this is what will happen. And then because of that fear, fretting, worry, anxiety, put this together. We don't even know what to put together, but not Ezekiah. From today, not you. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Then he turned his face to the wall, away from Isaiah. Isaiah, that's all you have for me on this wonderful day that I will die and not live. All right, please go your way. I know you will not pray for me because you want your prophecy to be fulfilled. You said it, and you want to be a good prophet, not a false prophet. You want what you declared on me to be fulfilled. All right, you can go. And he turned his face to the wall, and he prayed unto the Lord, the same Lord that said, Thou shalt die and not live. This man had the courage of mind to speak to that God. And he prayed unto the Lord, saying, Look at verse 3. Verse 3 tells us, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and then he goes on to say and i have done that which is good in thy sight he said oh lord look at your record and look at how i've submitted myself to your good way and ezekiah wept so verse four in verse four and it came to pass afore before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. So fast God answers prayer. That the word of the Lord came to him saying in verse 5 turn again and tell Ezekiah the captain of my people, the bishop of my people, the pastor of my people, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have heard thy prayer. I'm coming back to that verse. It was in Kumasi again. I went for one of those meetings I spoke about earlier. At the end of the meeting, a man came to me. And he said, this letter, written with red ink, was written to him. And when he got that letter, and he read that letter, written with red ink, he turned mental, lunatic, mad. And the people who wrote that letter were trading. They went to his house. They packed everything that is got because it's mental now. That's, that was the intention. And he said, please pray for me. I want to have my mind back, my sanity back, my brain, everything back. And I looked at him and said, I don't normally say that, but that's what I said. I said, go back home. All the idols and all the magic and all the occultic power you have gathered all this time looking for solution. Go and demolish them, destroy them, burn them off. Then come back in the evening. I'll pray for you and God will heal you. He said, thank you, sir. He went back home. He packed all those things together. He burnt them. Got rid of them. And then he came back in the evening. And after the ministration in the evening, he came to me. I said, you are the man I saw in the morning. I told you to go and, you know, destroy it. He said, yes, I am. But not the same man. I said, okay, let me pray for you. And I said, no, I'm okay. I'm all right. I said, how? 
How did that happen? He said, when I got back home, I did everything you told me to do. I looked at every corner and I packed them together outside at the backyard of my building. I bought everything. Immediately, I became well. All the prayer we could pray after that is thank God, the God of power, the God of miracle, the God of all possibilities. And today is your day. And I'm telling you, your life will never be the same again. Yeah. The infirmity, the sanity, the disease, the sickness that will have claimed your life. Gone in Jesus' name. I have heard your prayer. Then it goes on to say that I have seen that he has behold, I will heal thee. And on the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now that's not the end of the answer to the prayer of Hezekiah. God gave him what? He asked for healing, health, but now went beyond. This morning, the Lord will answer your prayer. He will go beyond what you are asking for. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and I will add unto thy days, tell me, I will add unto your days, 15 years. Why? All those things you should have done 15 years ago, 13 years ago, 10 years ago, you have not done, God will give you the extra time. You will be a performer, a doer, an achiever, and all the time you need to achieve what you should have done, which, which you have not done, the Lord will give you the extra years in health, in prosperity, in joy, and with the drive and the passion of a go-getter in Jesus' name. Your weakness will turn to strength. Your poverty will turn to prosperity. And your failure will turn to success. Without any rope tied on your feet, you will run and you will not fail in Jesus' name. What is the person I'm talking about there? You put everything aside now with nothing hindering you. And you stand up and you pray to the Lord. And as we pray to the Lord together today, Ezekiah's healing, Ezekiah's health, Ezekiah's drive, Ezekiah's possession, Ezekiah's passion, the Lord will give unto your life. Don't, why don't you open your mouth and say, Lord, here I am, Lord, here I am, Lord, here I am. He will do it. He will do it. I beat myself because of the way. Give yourself fully or reservedly unto the Lord. God will yet move in your life. Power will yet move in your life. What a God will serve. What a power we can possess. End time harvesting. Or the power we need for end time harvesting. Or the resources we need for end time harvesting. Whatever the 
peculiar demonstrations, actions, attitude of the people we are ministering to. The Lord will move through you. The Lord will walk through you. Looking at God and not the people. Are they difficult? Go ahead and minister to them. Have you been there before and you failed before? Go back there. You are a different person now. Mighty, powerful, irresistible. The other time you were there, you felt weak. You felt you could not. Go back there. Things are different now. In your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in your spirit. Things are different now. Go back there. You're a different minister, a different professional. Discover the new and time passion and time zeal and time dry that the things that scared you before, intimidated you before, the thing that God did air outside out of your balloon before All your energy you have lost has come back all the strength you have lost has come back all the destiny the determination you had before had come, had come back all the purity, all the holiness, all the sincerity, all the transparency you had before that now has come back. Passion, zeal, enthusiasm, drive. Everything has now come back. A different man, you're a different woman, you're no more the same as you used to be. Now, power resides in you. Faith resides in you. Unlimited possibilities resides in you. Go in this thy power. Go in this thy passion. Go in this thy pursuit. Is what you without power is what you what the divine purpose is with you. 
but something will only begin to happen when you get up when you move on when you open your mouth and you speak his word through you and against your healing also healing holistic healing is a chaos healing In Jesus' name we pray. Personalize that. In Jesus' name I pray. Not only amen, say what I say and say it for yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. When is the Kaya prayed? God answered. As you have prayed, God has answered. New power, God has answered. New passion, God has answered. New purity, God has answered. New pursuit, new drive, God has answered. And everything you have asked in prayer, like Ezekiah asked, and God answered, he has answered your prayer. Beyond what Ezekiah asked for, he wasn't asking for 15 years extra, God also gave him that. You will rise higher than your prayer. You will move faster than your prayer. You will live longer than your prayer. Raise that hand up as we are going to have household healing, holistic healing, as a chaos healing. Father, in Jesus' name, every one of us will come before your throne this morning. We come to ask for help, greater help than we ever thought we will have, greater power than we ever thought we could have, greater passion that we ever thought we could have. And Lord, as we come this morning to every brother, every sister, every minister, every preacher, every leader, Lord, supply them everything they have asked for in Jesus' name. Purity, give to everyone. Power, give to everyone. Passion and zeal give to everyone. Supportive men and women give to everyone. And achievement, success, accomplishment give to everyone in Jesus' name. Healing for the whole man. Healing for the whole woman. Every part, internal, external, up, down. Give them total healing, complete healing, perfect healing in Jesus' name. Long life. My brother, long life. 
My sister, long life. You will not die at the age your father died. You will not die at the age your mother died. You will live healthy. End time sickness will not come upon your life. End of life sickness will not come upon you in Jesus' name. Beyond this healing, long life, long achievement, long victory, and all the fears of the past. Maybe I will die. Maybe I will die. It is canceled from your life in Jesus' name. Lord, look at all your people. Add value to their lives. Add years to their lives. Add achievements to their lives. You gave Ezekiah 15 years extra. Whatever number of years you want to give extra. But Lord, give everyone here, everyone here, everyone here extra years. The devil will not determine how short they live, how long they live. Enemies will not determine how long they live, how short they live. God, the God of heaven, the mighty God, the God of all possibilities, add virtue, value, strength, years to every life. Confirm it, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. It is done. For you, it is done. For your family, it is done. For your ministry, it is done. You have an addition into your life even from this day in Jesus name thank you and God bless you